All right, I'm going to start the meeting and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get this fixed. Here comes Alex Galenis. So let's ring in the meeting. And we'll have Mr. Joe um, do our invocation, please. Joe Garcia. Certainly. Uh, those that are so inclined, please bow your heads. Uh, Father God, we are coming before you today as we begin our wonderful meeting. Although with concerns and maybe some with heavy hearts, as we see these ominous clouds and darkness upon us, see these images of fire and our first responders, our firefighters uh, exhausted, uh, laying on the ground trying to get some rest. We'd like to put them in your hands and ask that you protect them and take care of them, give them uh, health and strength and uh, keep them vigilant for any danger that might be surrounding them or around the corner. Also take care of those that are having a hard time uh, even breathing because of the quality of, the, of our air. Bless and protect us always. Give us a great meeting. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, Jackie, I believe you are going to, hang on one second here, but let me, uh, whoops. Jeez. Multitasking is not going well today, is it? Here's my meeting. All right, share my screen again so we have a flag. And then Jackie will give us our pledge. Hey, please follow me. Ready, begin. Pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America. America. To, the to the Republic of the Republic of the which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation, one nation, one nation indivisible, 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 with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Welcome, Tara. We'll, we'll give you a formal welcome here in a moment. All right, our patriotic song. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me. Every son of liberty Hurry, go today, don't delay, go today Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad Tell your sweetheart not to pine And be proud, her boy's in line Over there, over there Send the word, send the word over there That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming The drums run tumming everywhere So prepare, say a prayer Send the word, send the word to beware We'll be over, we'll be all over And we won't come back till it's over, over there Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Johnny, show the hun you're a son of a gun. Hoist that flag and let her fly. Yankee doodle, do or die. Pack your little kit, show your grit, do your bit. Yankees to the ranks, from the towns to the tanks. Make your mama proud of you and the old red, white, and blue. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums run tumming everywhere, so prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word to be there, we'll be over, we'll be all over, and we won't come back till it's over. Alrighty. Welcome to Escondido Rotary Zoom. We have a couple of guests here. Oh, there's a, there's a face I haven't seen in a while, Chad. How's it going? Uh, let's see. Yes. Um, Tara is here. Welcome. 
looks like Justin is back. He's not a guest now, but he's back in, in town. Uh, happy 60th there. Uh, who else? I saw someone that I did not recognize. And where'd it go? Is there any guests that I'm missing here that, other than our speaker? All right. With Christy. All right. Well, there we go. So let's do our welcome song. Howdy, we're glad to have you here. here. We sing along, we sing the crowd and clear. We are a program at the BCS again. Yay! Very good. All right, our calendar, upcoming calendar. Next week we have Tammy Wong talking to us about natural wines. There will be a Haven House project that night, and I understand Kelly's got that all filled up. Kristen Gaspar will be here on the 22nd. American Rugby on the 29th. Uh, Blair Lee talking about climate change on the 6th. Another Haven House, another board meeting like we had this morning. Um, and actually, let me throw in real quick. We're going to have another board meeting next week, an emergency one or a, a, a secondary one. Anyone wants to tune in, let me know. The 13th, we will hopefully be having our demotion of Jen. Um, and then Money Made Easy from Keith Rickenbacker on the 20th. Any member moments this week that I'm not aware of? All right. That's good news. Um, this kind of falls into a member moment. Um, Tig actually celebrated his birthday last, it was a week ago Sunday, his 92nd birthday, and this was a beautiful picture. But now we go to In the Wild. Miss Christine. Hi, In the Wild. Paulette has the best pictures on Facebook. I mean, she's always going and doing something and using her new camera. But this is a particularly good photograph of the Rotarians in the wild. I mean, walking Rotarians. And what a nice looking group. And all have their new masks on. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Either one of these is Rotarians, but um, yeah, if your dog poops, please pick it up. This was interesting. I got a chance to talk with Denise for just a few minutes when um, I made the first delivery, but here is our own Denise Luttrell. Um, as a part of the Salvation Army's Southern California chapter and their social media presence. So congratulations to Denise and our local Salvation Army. Oh, this is Vati, and she was with friends. Where, where it was it? At Kit Carson Park? No. Vati. Fila. Orphila Winery. Oh, nice. Oh, Orphelia. Anyway, it's a great picture, and it's fun that you're being able to get out and be with friends. Thank you. We were yeah. out commiserating it's actually the start amazing. of distance learning and all of our experiences with our kids. Oh, wow. Vate, what's it like to have a friend? <laughs> a great feeling. In the wild. Right? All right. Roy Henderson. I know this isn't going to be quite as clean cut as we thought it was going to be, but would you like to speak about uh, court of cuisine? I think Roy's here. You're here, aren't you, Roy? Oh. Okay. Oh, there he is. I, oh, he stepped away from his computer. Okay. Good timing. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe we'll get back to that then. Um, okay. Let's just move on. What time is it? Do we have a confirmed date yet, Andrew? For We do not. Okay. We, so, so, and again, Roy has a lot more to talk about than I do, but CORE is, because of a lot of uncertainty about what the world is even going to look like or Escondido is even going to look like um, next year, I mean, he does have a date that he's set with the, the um, Center for the Arts. 
but there are some current concerns about how it's uh, how core would work. Um, so he, we do have an update on it, but it may be better after um, after our board meeting next week when we talk in more detail and, and make some other decisions. But there he is. There he is. There's Roy. Yeah, sorry, I had to step away for a moment. You got two minutes. Okay. Every hello, everybody. We just had a board Hi, meeting. We just had a board meeting in the previous hour, and uh, I presented a, a written outline to um, Andrew, who uh, uh, distributed mm -hmm. to the board members as well. Essentially, what I'm saying, I've said this before to the group, is uh, I think Core de Cuisine has run its course. There's some issues. I don't think why, why we should leave it behind and do a more outdoor, an outdoor, more community-based event. And what I'm advocating, maybe scheduling this for our, for um, April of, of uh, next year. I think uh, one of the big issues with Corte de Cuisine is getting these uh, spirit vendors and restaurants to show up. We have the last two years, we've had a problem getting them to say yes, and that's when they had no good reason to say no. And now a lot of them are going to be financially stressed. Some of these restaurants are going to be gone, period. Um, and they, now they're going to have a good reason to say no. And so that's one big issue I think that we uh, need to overcome. And then the other is we're advocating the Rotary Club needs to be more community-based and have an event outdoors, full visibility, community members invited, and get more community members to show up. Uh, I think it's going to be a real plus. So uh, the board members had some mixed uh, feelings about that. Biggest, um, biggest concern they had is uh, lead time to get everything organized and put in place for an April event. And so that's what the meeting next Tuesday is about, is to discuss that in greater detail. Is that pretty well summarized it, Andrew? Yeah. Thank you for all the work that you've put in so far, because this is definitely as difficult as Corey is to run. This has got to be a nightmare year, honestly. So a um, lot of unknowns, and, and Roy's doing a great job dealing with those so far. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, all right. I, the Children's Discovery Museum, just a reminder that there, uh, it's an online fun, uh, gala. It costs nothing to tune in, but they will have a virtual auction and some other stuff going on. Um, they are members of our club, which of course we like to support them. And we are a, uh, a, a theoretical co-host of this. So I encourage you to sign up and uh, tune in next Thursday, a week from Thursday, the 17th. I think that's a week from Thursday. I've lost track. <laughs> um, uh, oh, attendance. We're starting to take attendance again, starting last week. And uh, to apply towards uh, um, uh, perfect attendance. Perfect attendance. Thank you, Mike. Um, so if and if you talk to somebody else who is is struggling with actually getting into Zoom or doesn't isn't comfortable using Zoom, um, unfortunately, our Facebook Live doesn't work with the new Facebook platform. Um, but you can you can go to our web page. You can go to our YouTube page. You can go to our Facebook page. You can watch any of our past meetings. And then you log in. Um, you log in to DACDB and you go to the enter makeup page under my data. And you can, if when you click that, it will allow you to enter your makeup. You just say, I watched the video on this date. Um, other clubs in town also have uh, virtual meetings. So if you attend uh, another club's virtual meeting, that's, um, that's uh, also a makeup that you can do, and this will all apply towards your uh, perfect attendance. Any questions on that? All righty. Are we having fun yet? Yeah, sure. <laughs> all right, our fun song. <laughs> one of the, I think one of the best things about this, this whole COVID thing, besides the fact that I don't actually have to get dressed to do these meetings, is that, um, the creativity of our fun song committee. And here we go. Mr. Ken, I'm no Jay Grossman, Manel. <laughs> Hi, Kara. Welcome to Rotary. 
there we have a little song to welcome to oh, our class. Oh, I better turn that up. Oh, we have a choice for District 3, where someone will represent us well. Now Tara is here. Gray. About her platform, she will soon tell. That's a lot quieter than I thought it was. Now's your chance. Our duty on election day. Our speaker today is one of the super is one of the people running for the supervisor. Our speaker today has a so do you want to watch with me? And a lawyer who can teach economists with the UN and World Bank and for fun on a surfboard at the beach. Vote, vote now's your chance. Our duty on election Sunday. Now Let's listen to Tara, and we will all learn. So welcome to Rotary today. Welcome, Tara. <laughs> there we go. I swear it was much louder when I set it up. I'm not quite sure what happened there. So. Ken lost his voice. Ken lost his voice eh, because he wasn't Jay Grossman. <laughs> So uh, introducing our today speaker today is Ms. Dara Sirwanka. Hi, Dara. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay, well, let me introduce you. Uh, Tara Lawson Remmer is an economist, a small business woman, and educator who served as senior advisor in the Obama administration, developing environmental policies to cut pollution from oil drilling and mining. Tara has a lifelong track record of fighting for economic opportunity and a healthy environment. A third generation San Diegan, Tara began her career working for the San Diego Council before starting a national organization to protect communities from big banks and organizing with the United Farm Workers. After graduating from Yale, she earned a full scholarship to law and graduate school, receiving her PhD in political economy and her law degree from NYU. She worked with the United Nations and World Bank, advancing environmental sustainability, climate finance, and a fair economy. Today, Tara teaches public policy at UCSD. Tara Lawson Remmer believes she has the proven experience our county needs. She will lead the fight to safeguard our beaches and coastlines, end sprawl development, address our affordable housing crisis, combat climate change, and protect our most vulnerable. Please welcome Tara Lawson Remmer. Hey. Hey. Hello. Hi. 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 Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Can everyone hear me all right? Mm-hmm. Great. Um, so how long how long do I have uh, to, overall? I want to make have sure we have approximately enough... 35 minutes. Great. I want to make sure we have enough time for a conversation and questions and answers. So um, Dara told you a little bit about me and my background. Um, I'll elaborate on that to start and then talk a little bit about why I'm running. Um, so I'm a third generation San Diegan and my grandpa was a Marine uh, stationed at Camp Pendleton. Uh, so I'm uh, born and raised here and very committed to the quality of life and protecting the quality of life in our community. Uh, but I also really grew up with a sense um, that public service is the most important value um, and the way that we, you know, find meaning in our lives is uh, by giving back to our community and by giving back to our neighbors. Um, so that's really why I'm running for, for the seat, uh, because I love San Diego. I'm having seen this community change over time, and I think we've, um, you know, gone in the wrong direction in some ways, and I, I think we, we need and deserve better leadership, and I want to talk a little bit about specifically how, how I think we've gone in the wrong direction and what we should be doing better. Uh, but also because, you know, my whole family, my entire life has, has always put public service front and center. Um, and I'm really excited to bring the lifetime experience that I've built working in the Obama administration, working as an educator, as a professor of economics, uh, working with the World Bank and the United Nations on sustainable development and economic inclusion uh, back to my own community. Um, and bring all those skills and experiences um, back to the community that I love and where I grew up and where I'm raising my family. So um, that's a little bit about um, my motivations and sort of the big picture about where I come from. Um, you know, and as, as Dara mentioned, I'm a small business owner, I'm an educator, 
Uh, I'm an economist, um, but also one of the things that uh, she didn't mention is that I am a, a big environmentalist, a big environmental enthusiast. Uh, in my spare time, I am an emergency medical responder and I take kids on backpacking trips. Um, I take uh, young people backpacking to teach self-reliance and respect for nature um, because I think those are some of our most important values and um, valuing our natural world is, is uh, really important to me. Um, so big picture, you know, I think our county for a really long time has put the interests of developers uh, before the interests of the community. Um, and we've seen a lot of sprawl development uh, that's paved over some of our most important open spaces uh, and led to a lot more traffic um, in which all of us are stuck. I, I remember when I was a kid, I'm a surfer, um, where I could drive from pretty close to downtown, um, down in um, North Park, um, up to Encinitas, where I now live, uh, 25, 25 minutes any time of day or night. And that's a joke now, right? Um, my, my, um, my aunt lives in Vista. So I would always go visit her in Vista. It was, you know, 35 minute drive and it was nothing. It was uh, something I could go, you know, a couple times a week. Now, um, if, uh, when you're not in COVID, um, that could be an hour and a half drive um, because of the traffic and because of the development and because of the sprawl. Uh, so protecting our open spaces and fighting to protect our open spaces and our quality of life is definitely my number one priority. Um, and along with that goes protecting our beaches and our coastlines and our environment, uh, because I think part of what makes San Diego such a special place is our open spaces. Uh, we have some of the most biodiverse uh, regions in the entire world here in San Diego. Uh, a lot of folks don't know that, but actually San Diego uh, is one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. So our open spaces are really valuable and really important, but also so are our beaches and so are our coastlines um, and protecting them from pollution and runoff. Um, you know, something we haven't done a very good job of and we could do a lot better. Uh, so that's the second piece of what I'm focused on. Um, and then going right along with that is climate change. Um, you know, I have a young daughter, she's one. And I think a lot about what is the planet gonna look like, you know, that she's going to inherit. What is this planet that we're leaving to our children and to our grandchildren? And um, it's just terrifying. You know, I know a lot of kids who are too afraid to even talk about climate. You know, I, I, I'm at their parents' house and we can't even mention the words climate change because it gives the children actual nightmares because they understand that the world is changing really rapidly because of our greenhouse gas emissions and we're not doing our part at all to stop those emissions. Um, and the, that it, the rubber really hits the road at a local level right here in San Diego County. So you know, certainly I think we should be doing a lot better nationally and globally. And that's where I've spent much of my career working is working on um, global uh, efforts for uh, green uh, investments and carbon reductions and investments in new technologies and infrastructure to reduce carbon emissions and to put us on a path towards sustainable development. I've been working on those issues at the World Bank in the United Nations, uh, but here in the United States, so many of these decisions are not decisions that can be made by the federal government or, you know, cannot be impacted by international treaty negotiations. They're really ne decisions made county by county. Uh, they have a lot to do with traffic. They have a lot to do with patterns of development. They have a lot to do with what kinds of um, investments we're making in transit and transportation and green infrastructure. It's a lot to do with how much we prioritize supporting businesses to uh, retrofit their buildings so that they can have more energy efficient buildings, how much we support businesses to invest in solar um, and other kinds of alternative energy sources. And those are all county policies. So right now our county is one of the worst in all of California, which is really sad uh, because I think we should be one of the best. Um, we have a climate action plan that's so bad. We've been sued uh, multiple times and found uh, deficient in uh, state court and the climate action plan has actually been thrown out. But our current supervisors keep bringing this plan back bring him back like a zombie um, and spending taxpayer money to defend a climate action plan that the judge has already said is so bad it doesn't even meet minimum state standards. So uh, I'm pretty appalled by that. I think we need to take real meaningful climate action and we need to be leading on climate action, not uh, being dragged along sort of by um, by our nails and our and a scruff of our neck to, to do what's right and to do what, what we need to do for the next generation. Uh, so one of the things I will definitely prioritize is taking meaningful, meaningful action on climate. So these are um, my major priorities. 
I also think um, we need to talk for a moment about public health because COVID has thrown into sharp relief how incredibly critical the county is as the frontline provider of social services. Um, you know, all of the services that we think of uh, as impacting our lives, that we think of as state or federal, they're all administered by the county. And our county's public health system was already quite weak uh, before COVID hit because of decades and decades of underinvestment in county workers and frontline workers and particularly our public health system. And that's part of why we've been really vulnerable under COVID. You know, the county should have been able to amount a much better and more aggressive and more effective response in terms of more testing, uh, more contact tracing, um, you know, more support for businesses to uh, comply with social distancing, re you know, regulations, because we can't just leave businesses to try to sort this out and muddle through on their own. That's not fair at all. Uh, but the county has not been able to step up to that uh, because for decades we've underinvested in sort of essential frontline services and public health. Uh, so I am, as Dara mentioned, I am a an economist, uh, my PhD is in political economy, I'm also an attorney, um, but I'm, you know, I spent my life working on evidence-based uh, solutions and evidence-based approaches to policy. So I think we absolutely have to be driven by evidence in our response and our engagement with COVID-19 um, and not try to uh, reopen too quickly or do things that sound a little crazy just because um, you know it, it's a hard time. Um, and so one of the things that we really do need to be investing in is public health here in San Diego County. And that is uh, not just um, not just important for COVID, uh, but sort of important more broadly. And COVID I think has um, really highlighted the vulnerabilities in our community because of the lack of those investments. Uh, and just a little bit more on this topic, one of the things that really I find so, so sad about what's going on with our COVID-19 crisis is that people who are already the most vulnerable are the ones that are most disproportionately impacted. Uh, of course, we are all being hurt by this uh, virus, but some people are honestly suffering more than others, right? You know, people who have pre-existing health conditions, people who are older, um, you know, people who have uh, immuno, who are immunocompromised, but it's not just that, right? People who are uh, frontline workers, people who have a lot of job insecurity, uh, people who don't have health care, people who if they lose their job, then they can't make rent, ends meet and pay rent the next month, people who don't have health insurance um, or they have health insurance through the job and they lose their job and now they don't have health insurance. Um, so all the same people who were the most vulnerable already are now left even more soft because of COVID-19. Um, you know, the, the less of a support network you have, then uh, sort of the worse off you are at this current moment. And I think part of what is important, you know, part of what I think uh, makes us a, a special country and certainly a special community is that we look out for each other, right? We don't let people who are, you know, vulnerable, we don't let them die. We don't let, just leave them out to die. And we don't let businesses who are struggling to make ends meet uh, have to try to meet this crisis on their own. We step up to help out our local businesses. We step out to help out the most vulnerable members of our, of our um, community. And that's a really valuable, really critical role that the county has to play. And I don't think has played, um, has, has done the job to be honest. Um, you know, and it's not completely because they have just drop the ball over the last six months, although I think we could have done better. It's really because of decades of underinvestment. You know, we have a county structure that was just not ready for this crisis um, because we had not been investing it for so long. Uh, we have some of the, uh, it, we have a real problem with ret uh, retention for really good county workers uh, because we're not um, treating them with respect and dignity and um, not you know, some many times not compensating them adequately. So these are all the things that I think need to change at the county. Um, and there are many other issues um, that I'll mention just briefly, but I, I think these are the two things that are most top of my mind right now, which is public health and COVID and the environment. Um, a couple other big issues, um, affordable housing is really important. Is something that I'm going to be uh, working a lot on. Uh, mental health services is really important um, and something I'm going to be focused on. And um, also uh, childcare. You know, like I said, I have a one-year-old, and so um, you know, 
making sure that we have uh, good childcare and are supporting schools and childcare options for everyone in our community is a really uh, high priority for me as well. Um, so why don't I just stop there? I always prefer to learn from you and listen to what your priorities are and how can I partner with you in um, fighting for our community here in San Diego. So let me just stop and open it to questions. All right, go ahead. Who has a question? Wow. Well, I'll go. I'll go. Tara, I just wanted to say I'm a big fan and I've been following all of your uh, social media posts. And I first heard about you from my son, who is a sergeant with the county sheriff's department and then started looking into it after that conversation. My question is, um, where are you in the polls right now? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So we're actually a dead tie, dead even, uh, me and, and Kristen, um, which is actually pretty amazing because it's, pr it's very hard to unseat an incumbent. So uh, her negatives are very high in our district. Um, she's about tied for negatives and positives, which is not a good place to be. Um, and so that means that when you look at the polling, we're tied dead even. So we're just working really hard. You know, we know that when people hear about um, both of us and they hear uh, positives and negatives about both of us, um, that we, they, we end up way ahead. So actually we, um, in our polling, we ended up 14 points ahead after positives and negatives, but that really requires that we do the work and tell people the positives. So, mm -hmm. so we can't just uh, sit there and think that that's great because it, it, it could happen. It only happens if we make it happen. So uh, we're just working really, really hard. Um, we're phone banking uh, many nights a week. We're out there uh, doing socially distanced door hang drops. Um, you know, we have thousands of volunteers because this is really a grassroots effort. Uh, that that's all about what the what the community wants to see for our future. Jan, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, Tara. Thank you very much for being here today and for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I I certainly don't disagree with much of what you said in regards to funding projects. My question, however, is how do we reassign the money to fund the things that you're mentioning? Uh, taking away from other things that, that may be also very important without raising taxes? Um, great question. So I actually like to point people to um, a article that Jerry Sanders wrote um, a couple months ago in the UT. So Jerry Sanders is a funny person for me to uh, mention as a, as a role model in this regard, but he had a lot of good ideas about um, how we take existing programs and realign resources to invest in things that uh, should be higher priorities. Um, so for example, you know, we have, a, and this is actually something interesting. I got a lot of these ideas from the sheriffs um, that they get called out on calls that they think, why am I here? Like what in the world? It's a, there's no public safety issue. There's not, this is not a public safety issue. There's a mental health issue. Uh, there's a homelessness issue. Um, it's a social service call. And so they don't want to be there because that's not their job. And then the people aren't getting the services that they need because um, it's the wrong people being sent. So there's, for example, a program in Eugene, Oregon called Cahoots, where they reassigned a lot of those first uh, frontline calls from instead of sheriffs going, uh, they resigned it to crisis response units. And we now have a pilot program in San Diego County just started a couple months ago to try this out. And I think it's great. And I think we need to build on that and expand it. So I think that's one example. Um, I think there's a couple other things where we can sort of look at, you know, the work that we're doing and how do we uh, make sure the right people are on the front lines uh, make, doing the responding. Um, another thing that I think we should do, um, and I, by the way, most of the time, the best ideas from this comes from the people who are doing the work. I am a firm believer that nobody walks in uh, you know, and <laughs> with all the answers, right? Like we do the best work when we really listen and we listen to the people who are trying to do their jobs and care about our community and they don't necessarily have the support or tools they need to, to serve our community as well as they would like. So the firefighters um, have another idea, which I think is great. You know, they right now are, when there's a health issue, they, they get called. And sometimes it's a health issue 
that they shouldn't have to take someone to an emergency room because if the person doesn't have health insurance and they get sent to the emergency room, it costs us as taxpayers thousands and thousands of dollars because uh, taxpayers, because the emergency rooms have to take people who are, uh, arrive in the emergency room if they don't have health insurance, we pay, right? Uh, but the firefighters will show up and the people sometimes literally need like a prescription for a drug that they already even already have the prescription for, but they're at the pharmacy and they don't have the money to pay. So they need $30 for their prescription, but they don't have their $30. So then they get sent to the emergency room and then it costs us $10,000. Well, it seems like it would be a big tax savings to equip um, mobile health units in our community so that folks were getting the services they need, getting that health services in real time um, from folks who are already trained to, to provide those health services uh, and with, at a big savings rather than sending them to the emergency room. So I think a lot of this, the work is about looking at where are we sort of trapped in red tape and therefore wasting money where if we you know, were more thoughtful about how we get the best impact and the best results, then we would be able to realign resources. Um, and I'm just gonna take an example of this approach um, from a very different context. Uh, but as you know, um, I'm a, an empirical researcher by training. And um, one of my colleagues, a guy named Michael Kramer, um, did a big study on how do we improve school outcomes in uh, all over rural Africa, in Uganda and Kenya, et cetera. And they had all these expensive, do they needed more teachers and they needed to build buildings. It's really hard to build buildings. It's expensive. It was just very hard and they weren't getting anywhere. And so they had an idea. They said, well, what about if we just focused on, you know, making sure kids were healthier when they were in school? How, how would that do in improving health outcomes? So they did a test to see if just giving a very, very cheap drug, uh, it was an anti-worming um, medicine, an anti-worming um, pill so that kids didn't get infected with worms, if that would help. And it was ex just pennies. It was very expensive and inexpensive, like 10 cents uh, for the pill. And 30 years later, people's health outcomes, and not, not just health outcomes, but people's schooling outcomes and life outcomes and job outcomes and income outcomes are so much better um, if, they got the, if they got the deworming medicine. And that's the kind of thing that I think kind of approach, you know, where you, you don't just like trying to do the same old thing. You sort of look at what's working in other places, look at what's been effective, what's, look at what, what's cost effective and say, look, we don't need to be the best. We don't need to be the followers. We're going to try that here in San Diego. And I, I mean, of course, it's a different context, Kenya and San Diego, but I think that the principle holds, right, which is they were banging their head against the wall, spending thousands and thousands of dollars on these expensive buildings, and all they needed was a 10 cent deworming pill, and it really improved health outcomes. So that's, a, I think, a snapshot into sort of my general approach and general philosophy. Thank you. Okay, next question. We have time for- Hey, Andrew, I, this is Roy. I've, I've got a question. Go ahead, Roy. Yeah, hello. Um, I know this issue is outside your district, but um, I have a question about the sewage flow off the Tijuana River into the Pacific Ocean. I know this has gone on forever, decades. I've lived here for 40 years, and mm -hmm. I, I know uh, my son is a civil engineer, and he thinks the only real solution to that is build a wastewater treatment plant. The United States pays for it. The United States runs it. Um, to otherwise uh, people in Imperial Beach are being impacted forever with this. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I actually do. So as you, as you know, I'm a surfer. So I think about this a lot. I actually was talking to my friends, um, my friends, a lifeguard in IB. So we, <laughs> we talk about this a lot. The, the uh, one fact folks probably don't know, um, the beach has been closed for I th he, I th what he told me, I think was 150 days this year. That's insane. More days closed than open. And it's totally unacceptable. And it's not only impacting IB, it impacts all of us. That sewage flows up the coast. It, it flows in the, it gets pushed out to sea and it flows up the coast and then it gets trapped and it comes back down again. So it's in Encinitas, it's in Carlsbad, like it's in La Jolla. It's, you know, it's all, it's all up and down the coast. It's not just an IB problem. Um, so there's a couple things. So first of all, I do think we've made some progress, um, and I, I want to give some acknowledgement to especially uh, some of our leaders down in IB who've been working tirelessly, and they have won some resources to invest in remediation um, and to try to 
uh, fix the problem that we've got right now, um, basically to try to treat uh, a lot of the area that's been become essentially like a toxic dump. Um, and so they've they've actually managed to win some Superfund money and other money from the federal government to fix those uh, to fix that area. So that's one step. But I I do think that you're right in the long term. This will, problem will never be fixed as long as Tijuana has no sewage system because it will just continue, right? All of the sewage will just continue flowing out and into the ocean and you can uh, do all the remediation you want. And then tomorrow it is a disgusting disaster once again. So I do think we need to uh, help Tijuana build a sewage treatment plant, but I don't think it should be uh, US taxpayer dollars. Uh, I think there's a much better solution. Uh, as I mentioned, I work for the World Bank and so, you know, there's programs <laughs> that are actually designed to lend money at low or no interest to developing countries and emerging economies to help with environmental investments and sustainable development. And there's two sources of, of resources that I think that we, they could tap. One is called the Inter-American Development Bank. It's basically the, the Latin American version of the World Bank and the other is the World Bank. So there's two funds. Um, why this hasn't moved is very complicated, uh, but I think we could see uh, much more progress on this front if this became a priority for the U.S. <laughs> because the U.S. basically sets the agenda for the IADB, the Inter-American Development Bank, and sets the agenda for the World Bank uh, because we're the biggest shareholder of both institutions. So um, yes, we need to help Tijuana build a sewage treatment plant. Yes, this needs to be a priority, but it should be, uh, it should be money that's particularly designed for this purpose from the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. It should not be uh, federal funds. Here's a follow-up so on that. Okay. I know, I, as I recall, there was a sewage treatment plant built for the Tijuana River flow maybe 20, 30 years ago. Are you familiar with that story? And is, is that plant still been, I believe it's just gone beyond capacity, but do you know if that plant is still- Yeah, I properly, did. I went down and did- maintained and operated? So just, yeah, first of all, I went down and did a tour with Serge Zadina, who's the mayor down in IB, but then I went back and I went hiking all, you know, there's a, there's sort of like um, a, a, an area that's a natural preserve right there at the border, like right where the sewage treatment plant is. So I just went hiking and checked it out because I wanted to really understand what was going on. So um, there is a treatment plant. Um, it's way too small. Number one, it's, it's way over capacity. But number two, the problem with it is it's, it's only designed, it's sort of like trying to catch the sewage that's coming into the US side, but environments don't have borders. So it's, it's designed to like try to stop the sewage coming from Tijuana flowing into the US, but that is not gonna be a strategy that's effective because it can come, it can seep in through the groundwater. It can like flow out into the ocean on the Tijuana side, right? So you have to think more holistically about the solution, not just try to like essentially put a stopper in the sewage place, uh, the sewage source, which is what this treatment plant did. Uh, so it's both not like sort of from a, a theoretical perspective, it's like not a, it's not a, a holistic enough solution, but also it's also just over capacity. So both things are true. Thanks. Questions, any more questions? We've got 10 more minutes here. Yes, Dara. Hi. Um, I actually heard you speak a few times, Tara. Um, and one thing that you had talked about at one of, in one of your speeches that I thought was really interesting was the amount of decline of traffic uh, that we would need um, to actually make a difference in terms of our footprint. Um, and I think you had mentioned, you know, like it was relatively small, like 10 to 15% is what is causing the gridlock. Can you speak to that at all? Am I misremembering or? Yeah, so there's two issues, right? There's our carbon footprint and then there's what's causing the gridlock. Um, and they're interrelated, but not the same. So two, thing, two things that always stick out to me, which is one, 40% of our carbon emissions in San Diego comes from cars idling in traffic. That's a huge number. 40% of our carbon emissions comes because people are literally stuck in their cars being real unhappy. So this seems very dumb. Like we're polluting our planet and everyone's like very unhappy stuck in their cars. So uh, I, I think that's a, there's clearly like a win right there. Um, so then the question is, well, how do we reduce folks idling in traffic? I mean, obviously 
one of the things is we just have to get less cars on the road, you know, and I, we can talk about a lot of ways to do that. But the other is just we need less traffic. So even if we had only a 10% reduction in cars, that would be enough to free up the gridlock because what happens the way that our highway system functions is it's fine, it's flowing, it's flowing, it's flowing, it's flowing. It's the last 10% of cars that push it from moving at a rapid clip into stalled and uh, traffic jams. It's, it doesn't, um, it's not a change. We all now understand the, the principle of exponential versus uh, arithmetic. So the relationship between number of cars and amount of uh, traffic congestion is uh, exponential, not arithmetic. So it's really the last couple cars that like push it over the brink. Any follow up, Dara? Okay. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing on that point. I think uh, what I find helpful about that is it just, it feels more hopeful, right? When you think, oh my Lord, we're going to have to cut our cars in half. It just feels daunting. <laughs> but right. if you're, if you think, oh, you know what? If we just cut our cars by 10%, it could make a really big impact. It, ju it, it just makes me feel like, look guys, this is something we can do. We just got to come together and make it happen. Hey, this is Roy Henderson again. I'll follow up on what you just said about that, you know, tipping point, the last 10% of cars. I've read that last 30, 40 years, the length in miles of a typical uh, person's commute to work is like almost double. It has. And because uh, of the cost of housing and where companies are located and a lot of reasons companies don't feel uh, married or to their employer anymore because the employer can get rid of them at every time so they don't select where they live based on where they work because they don't mean that last a lot of factors and so w what are your thoughts about just getting people to live closer to work that would cure the cure that tipping point problem right there I think it's a great idea I'm a huge supporter I mean that's what I think it's very integrated with the question of sprawl development I mean one of the rush and one of the justifications it's always being put out for all the sprawl is we need more homes. Unfortunately, a lot of those homes are very expensive. So they're not affordable and they're very far from people's places of, of work. So I think we should be doing a much better job of encouraging building of affordable homes closer to where people live and work, uh, partly to address the affordable homes problem, uh, partly because it's good for the climate and has less time in people's cars and partly because it would be better for traffic. You know, obviously if people don't have to drive as far, then there would be less traffic. So I, th I do agree that uh, uh, getting folks living closer to where they work is going to be a big part of the solution. Okay, thanks. Beautiful. All right, next question. Is there going to be a debate between the two candidates? None is scheduled. I'm open to do it. I love to talk about the issues, so. Okay, okay. there we go. Christy, go ahead. <coughs> Hi, um, I currently live in Escondido and work in downtown San Diego. I've commuted back and forth for a little over 13 years. Um, I, for the last four years, I've owned an electric vehicle. I, um, understand that there is a very large proposed um, tax increase that Sandag will be proposing and as a candidate for the District 3 voters, would you support a tax increase for taxpayers to support that large plan? Right now, I don't think I have enough information or details about the plan uh, to know where I stand on it. I actually think that they need to uh, they've been saying for a while that they're going to put out um, more details. And I think we all need to know a lot more about it before we have a view. I mean, I love the idea of us, you know, investing in repairing our roads and investing in, you know, transit where we need transit. You know, obviously, we have a very diverse county, so we need different kinds of transit solutions for different parts of our county. Um, but it has to be in a way that benefits all of us. And I don't think I have enough information yet about what, you know, basic, first of all, who would be paying those taxes, but also uh, who would be benefiting to know if it's a, it's going to be in all of our interest um, to have a view on that. The other thing I think we should keep in account, um, and I've been thinking a lot about, is 
there's a lot of opportunity now that um, expectations and norms have shifted with COVID-19 to really encourage folks to work from home. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really valuable and really important. So that's something I've been talking a lot about. It's uh, something I'm working on and, um, and uh, in being a partner to our business community uh, to encourage them to uh, encourage their employees to work from home part time or, you know, maybe full time if possible, I think will go will be an important linchpin of our strategy around traffic and climate moving forward. All right, very good. If there's no other questions, all right, then I'm going to thank you very, very much, Tara. I will uh, make sure that we get a hard copy of your um, fun song to you, suitable for framing. Um, that's our, our song committee handles all of that. And uh, I'll try and get you a better audio version of it as well so that mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can sing along. Uh, we, we've actually stopped singing along because you don't of want me to sing along. No, <laughs> no I'm very um, vulnerable about uh, acknowledging my strengths and weaknesses and uh, singing is not a strength. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, if you're in the shower, I don't think anyone would notice, but that's all good. Uh, and that's where I do all my singing is really what I'm trying to say there. Um, thank you very, very much for speaking to us. It was very informative, um, and I appreciate uh, your being here today. And uh, you're welcome to come back and visit us anytime you want. Um, I'm going to formally close the meeting here. If, uh, if you want to stick around afterwards and chat with other people, you're welcome to. I'm not going to shut down the board for a while. But let's end our program with our weekly shower thought. Everyone says don't talk to strangers, but in order to friends, you have to talk to strangers. Oh. So, we we'll close the meeting with our bell. Well, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. We will see you next week.